Hello, and welcome to Money Matters. My name is Jim Butler with Vidiri Wealth Management, and my co-host tonight is Dave DeWitt of DeWitt Capital Management. Hi, David. Jim, good to see you again. Good to see you. Well, before we get to our exciting guest, uh, because I'm sure we're going to learn a lot of uh, new things as far as digital marketing and, and developing websites is concerned, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges that our viewers may be faced with uh, as we look out into the future and, and some of the uh, challenges uh, that are in front of us. Um, so with the Trump administration and the media seeming to do battle every day of the week, uh, there's no shortage of headlines. Uh, but if we can look beyond that and dig down to what should an investor do, uh, what are some of the things that you're talking with your clients about in order to calm things down and to stay focused for the long term? Aside from taking drugs? <laughs> it depends on which one. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, sometimes I think people get a little carried away because of the, the the way the administration is sometimes. But um, I, I think that if somebody's looking at a way to sort of insulate themselves a little bit from the, some of the volatility in the market, the uh, something that generates a steady income, um, one of the things the Trump administration is in favor of is the U.S. developing its own energy resources. So mm -hmm. natural gas, natural gas liquids, oil, um, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of natural, certainly a lot of natural gas in the northeastern part of the country, a lot of oil in uh, West Texas um, and Oklahoma, um, really years and you know, decades and decades of, um, of uh, supply. Um, petrochemical plants are, are locating in the Gulf of Mexico, up in Canada, Pittsburgh. These are chemical plants that are basically turning ethane into ethylene, the building blocks of plastics. Um, we see a pipeline coming down out of North Dakota that's going to supply uh, oil, you know, to uh, actually winding up in the Gulf of Mexico that would ultimately be exported. And, um, and in a, a, a LNG, liquefied natural gas mm -hmm. exports, increasing yearly from the Gulf of Mexico and also um, exports actually into Mexico. So this whole area of energy infrastructure is going to get a shot in the arm from the Trump administration because I think once projects are approved, um, challenges uh, that are not legitimate will just be overruled and once these right of ways are completed, the, the projects will be completed, which is good for those people that are invested in energy infrastructure. Well, you made a comment early on and, and that is it can also be income producing. Yes. Uh, so yes. is that in the form of like dividends and interest? It could be uh, one of two ways. One could be dividends and interest, and the other way could be through distribution through a master limited partnership. The energy infrastructure, uh, th that would be just a simple a C corporation that um, maybe owns pipelines and storage facilities, um, terminals or shipping. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these companies are just basic en energy. Uh, they just move and store and process. Others are structured. Um, as a pass-through entity, they're called mass limited partnerships, and they um, there's certain tax benefits, but there's also some tax complications there that you really should just consult your uh, accountant about regarding mm -hmm. that. But generally speaking, if you just boil it down, it's an undervalued industry right now. It's providing, and I think it will be for a while. Um, it provides basically steady income that historically has grown over time and can supplement you know, part of a portfolio for someone who's looking to diversify and get into, into a, a different category. Well, it sounds like, David, you're talking about an area uh, where the demand is going to not only continue at a fairly steady pace, but for the most part also expand quite a bit and could very likely position the United States as more of a global player in the energy market. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. Uh, we are exporting a million barrels of oil a day. That was not even legal a year ago uh, and in the past. Um, that And that can go up over time. Also, uh, liquefied natural gas as an alternative to Russia providing uh, natural gas to Western Europe. Um, we'll be shipping liquefied natural gas terminals in Europe and Asia and Japan. Uh, nuclear power is is getting a bad rap. 
uh, in the Fukushima and other incidences where people see the, you know, the, the potential danger there. So as coal plants go out and as nuclear is not renewed, then the natural replacement would be natural gas, which produces half the carbon emissions. And the United States is producing 12% less than they were just six or seven years ago in terms of carbon emissions just by switching to natural gas and some renewables. Mm -hmm. So that trend, I think, should continue. So I think that um, the way the investors can get on board is to invest in companies that uh, operate the energy infrastructure. How about just natural trends within the markets? Um, you know, the markets move up, the markets move down, but over time, the trend line uh, really uh, over five, 10, particularly 15, 20 year time periods, uh, things tend to keep growing. And reasons for what you just mentioned as far as the energy sector just being one of many areas that will continue to expand. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. The, um, uh, the major, major oil projects that would be like drilling in the Arctic or major offshore projects that cost tens of billions of dollars by companies like Shell or BP, those have been shelled, and they're now going to go to the in, you know United States and do the fracking and, and get it get to the oil and natural gas quickly without a lot of expense. So the United States is really the swing producer now for oil, and in the future will also be for liquefied natural gas as that becomes more of a worldwide commodity. Yeah, yeah. So we have a really good future as far as uh, you know, the United States becoming energy independent. Well, it sounds like it, and that uh, actually leads into uh, our question of the day. Uh, as uh, Jerry Feynman from Ardmore writes in, do you think the change in the administration will affect the energy markets in the U.S.? That, that's a great question. and. Um, Yes, the answer to that is yes. I mean, within two days after uh, he became president, uh, he gave the go-ahead to something called the Dakota Access Pipeline from North Dakota down into Illinois, and um, there had been a lot of protests, um, Indian tribal protests. I remember that. And also the Keystone XL, he said, go ahead with that too, because, um, and I think other, I mean, I just think the general miasma or environment you know, f for moving ahead is more positive. So I just think that, I mean, when you try to put a pipeline through, if you're trying to get a pipeline from Northeast, you know, Pennsylvania into Boston, um, you've got to go through a lot of political um, community meetings to get this thing through. No doubt. And in fact, Boston, you know, when <clears throat> it gets colder, is paying 15 or $20 um, uh, dollars, uh, when natural gas prices are at three or two. Uh, and they're importing their natural gas from Yemen and Nova Scotia and who knows where because they, we're, we're 100 miles away. There's like unlimited supplies. Just getting that through is difficult just from local politics, not, right. let alone national politics. So um, I think it, it's, uh, it's a good way to be. So if you can invest in the, what we call the midstream, the pipeline operators, the uh, storage facilities, terminals, shipping, processing, separating natural gas from ethane and propane and butane, all those businesses we call the midstream businesses, um, you can get an income of around 7% on average in that area. Right. And I think under the next you know, few years, there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why there'll be growth. Yeah, yeah, great, good answer, good insight. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And if you have a question that you would like answered, uh, send it in uh, along with uh, your details uh, to the, in the following manner. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, T-V dot com. Our special guest tonight is Jason Madsen with Madsen Consulting Group. Uh, Jason's area of specialty is uh, 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 
designing websites and digital marketing. Welcome, Jason. Welcome, Welcome. Jason. Nice to be here. Good, good to have you here. From a technology standpoint, uh, certainly uh, the demand for your services, I would imagine, just will continue to grow. Uh, so just as a form of introduction, uh, why don't you tell us who you are and how you define digital marketing? Yeah, so uh, I'm Jason Matson, and I'm the CEO of Matson Group. We have a small uh, elite team of uh, people that work for us, about six of us, so kind of in the boutique agency side. Um, our specialty is e-commerce, um, though we help businesses of all types uh, grow uh, online. Um, I think you're right that it's a huge market demand. It's getting bigger every day. Um, there's not enough people even to supply uh, everyone with the, the kind of need that they have. Um, and even in the industry, I think it's grown more aggressively than any, any of us anticipated three, five, ten years ago when we started. Um, mm. So it's, it's amazing. I think what um, we maybe didn't see in the year 2000 was how everyone having a smartphone, everyone has a microcomputer in their pocket. <laughs> Everywhere you go, third world countries, you know, right, are, David. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, I will, I will, I will uh, attest to that. Yeah, yes, these these things are ubiquitous. They're ubiquitous. It's an amazing time. Some of us have two or three. We have one for business, one for personal. We'll have an iPad on our lap with the TV on. So it, it's an amazing time for media and, and, and digital, and, and uh, even more so. So, what do you help your clients with? If somebody comes to you as a complete beginner and says, how, ask you the question, how do I take advantage of this opportunity? Where do you start with somebody like that? We start at a very basic level. So a lot of agencies specialize in a particular function. So they might be an SEO agency. They help you get listed on Google. Um, maybe they're an email marketing agency. Um, they have some sort of specialty. We're a little different. What's uh, SEO, by the way? Uh, search engine optimization. Okay. Yeah, so how do you get in those, that pack of Google listings organically without having to pay for it? And then there's the paid aspect, too. Can you use Google AdWords, Bing ads, things like that? Um, our approach with, with each client is, is a little different. Um, my, my background is actually running uh, large e-commerce companies. I'm not an agency person by trade. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I have an MBA from Drexel uh, in entrepreneurship. I have an MBA from Drexel. Well, it's good to meet a fellow alumni. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we really work with a business, and the first thing we do is learn about them. So how do they make money, what's special about them. So every single business is different. They have different assets, skills um, that we can leverage. Um, and that kind of helps us guide the marketing plan, the website, whatever we need to do. Um, and even the same business uh, type may have a different strategy. Um, for example, we work with a, a good number of construction companies. Um, okay. One of our very first clients um, came to us and they're a couple that was entering the idea of retirement, a little pre-retirement. And they said, we've been due, we get lots of inbound leads from our website. That's where we get all, all of our business. But it's all little tiny jobs. It's all, can you fix this? Uh, do a little woodwork patching here. And they said, what we want to do are build houses. Right. One big job. And for them, it was analyzing what their website was working, but for the wrong thing. So mm. we analyzed the website. The website was all about these small jobs. Wow. It's a very basic thing. So we helped them put forward on the website the kind of jobs and works they, they wanted to do and ran a little bit of focused advertising. And now they build two houses a year. So they call us and they say, we need to build a house in 45 days. Can you turn on the machine? And we turn, <laughs> turn it on. on. The yep, they, they close a the deal. They go build a house for five months and then we turn it back on. That's interesting. So, uh, so to answer your question, it really depends on who we're working with, what their strategies are in business and in life, uh, and, and we uh, you know, craft a plan and, and develop the tools that will help them achieve that. Right. How much should a <clears throat> website cost, and um, what should I look for when in hiring an agency? Websites are, are a lot like cars. Um, okay, a lot of options. There are a lot of options and a lot of price points. Mm -hmm. um, so you can legitimately build a website for a few hundred dollars. Yeah. You, you can do it yourself if you have the time, energy, creativity, and, and the ability to learn, um, all the way up to several hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it really depends on what you're trying to tackle. Like an Amazon website would probably be pretty expensive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they probably have uh, many millions of dollars invested in infrastructure plus staff and things like yeah. that. For most businesses, um, 
you're probably in the four to twelve thousand dollar range for your base website. And then if you're building on extra functionality, maybe e-commerce, you need an interesting directory, there's more photography, a huge catalog of products or something like that, it could kind of build up from there. But sky's the limit. Um, I think the key really with hiring a good agency is finding something that somebody that really digs in and understands you and your business sure. uh, and not trying to push a particular solution on you. So if you show up to the meeting and they've already got the website done, uh, they're probably not going to listen and engage you. And, and really, it's an emotive um, process. When um, you say emotive process, what's, what does that mean? So people are now living their lives on the web. You know, so I, I think some studies say that people are spending as much as 11 hours a day in front of some sort of screen. Oh, my gosh. That's scary. And so That's a lot of time. That's a lot of time. Uh, so instead of, you know marketing as the web may have been done five to ten years ago, you really need to understand who you're speaking to on behalf of this client, how you're going to engage them. And that's what I mean by emotive, is you're crafting user stories about who's important to this entity. Um, you know, it's really obvious people think, oh, websites are just e-commerce. Uh, and there is a lot of e-commerce on the web, but there may be other businesses. Maybe they're raising revenue. And this website really needs to speak to potential investors. Yeah. Sure. Um, maybe it's a, a business where they know they're going to sign a contract uh, in person, uh, somebody who designs and builds pools or landscaping. But a customer is going to go and check out their previous work on their website. They're going right. to see that they're right. you know, listed in the Better Business Bureau and those kind of uh, you know, validation points. So as marketers, we really need to empathize with who the end user that's important to that business is mm -hmm. so that we can craft language that speaks to their use case. So here's a situation, and I'm sure uh, you both have seen it and maybe our listeners as well. Uh, I'll spend time uh, looking at different websites as I'm understanding uh, a, a, a prospective client, for example, maybe doing research on a new client, the company that he works for. Uh, and much of the time, the website is very informative. But when they're not informative, what really shows is almost to the point where it's archaic. And if it's not archaic, what, you, what I think of is they're holding something back. They don't want, they either haven't been, they, they haven't been up updated mm -hmm. and talked to a firm like yours, or they're holding something back and they don't want to tell you anything more. Sure. And so it leaves me as an observer suspicious. So what would you say to a potential customer like that? Yeah, I, I think it's a very good point. Um, I think what a lot of businesses don't understand is that the web is really a 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week marketing machine. It's, a sa it's an extra salesperson out there. Uh, and no matter what your industry is, people are going to vet several vendors for most decisions. Mm. Um, and, and that's becoming even more prolific as searching for vendors and, and solutions is uh, easier with our phones. So I think you, you now have to have a mobilely optimized website. And you have to realize that no matter what your business is, even if everything is a handshake deal, there are people who are looking at the websites as they try to, to suss out whether they're going to do business with right. you. And while it may not um, be what closes every deal, it is a factor. And even subtly psycho psychologically, when they go to that website and it hasn't been updated since 2003, they think, Oh, are they still? Are they still in business? They're still in business. Are they still investing? Are they making their products any better? Or is this yeah. the old whatever? Yeah, right. right. You so know, are they keeping a, up with the times? A blog once in a while. Yeah. So yeah. I, I went to a I went to a website and it, uh, the last news was 2015, and I'm thinking, uh, not much, not much going on, or they're just not updating their website. You know, mm -hmm. you, and you you leave feeling yeah. like, yikes, yuck. And that's a question we're asked a lot: is how how often should I update my website? And I think that really depends on your industry and what you're trying to put forth. I'm not a huge believer in forcing businesses to write a lot of blog content, um, which is popular out there right now yeah. and has been for a while. But I do think you need regular content. That content could be quarterly. Yeah. You know, that's fine as long as it's every quarter. So yeah. what looks really bad is when you have weekly, weekly, weekly blogs and then 2014 it shuts off. Yeah. It's like another indication that you're out of business. Yeah. So I don't, I, I don't yeah. advise it. Like either start doing it monthly, quarterly, some kind of cadence that made sense to, to your clients, uh, or just shut it off. Like don't do things poorly.
Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've read, and I don't know much about this, but if you, let's say you write a blog every other week, mm -hmm. and you reference terms in the blog that represent your industry people might be searching for. Mm -hmm. How does that interact with Google and search optimization? Yeah, well, that's a constantly changing puzzle. So uh, I'll give you the answer for the near term is that the biggest opportunity, and, and that's what search engine optimization is. How do I come up with the concept to write about so that people will find my blog? Um, and the most basic place to start is to think about the customers and clients you speak with and what are their most common questions. Mm. So the same way you might prep a customer service agent to answer the phone and to you know, overcome objections or to answer common questions is the same way that you might first approach SEO. Um, so when you're dealing in you know, maybe a securities that, that's a lesser known security uh, investment, you would say, well, people maybe heard about it on some CNN or some sort of uh, show, what do they, what are they going to search for to find out more information? Sure. So even basic definitions, and we try to talk about now semantic language. So the computers that are the, and robots that are mm -hmm. going through the internet are starting to pick up natural language. You know it from speaking with Siri. You can ask her questions, and she can supply you with answers. Yeah. Um, they're learning as they go through. So a lot of what you can do now is to write actual questions that people would ask and then answer them. That's a really good idea. And the other thing is taking off is voice search. So I don't know how often you're doing it, but I see it more and more where people are like, Siri, what, what's the closest pizza restaurant? Right. Yeah. And they're not even typing it in. Well, so yeah. it's becoming a more natural language. The internet's starting to answer questions and interact with you in a more natural way. And, and the search engines are trying to get those robots to start to really understand the way we speak instead of focusing on keywords. Uh, I got a question for you. Yeah, and, sure. And this is not on the list of questions. Why is it when you want to sign up for something, you have to look at these weird looking letters that you know you can barely <laughs> figure out and then like, write them in and half the time I get them wrong. <laughs> What's that all about? It, it's basically to keep, um, so usually you're filling out some sort of form that's going to go into a database. It yeah. might trigger an email to uh, somebody to follow up with you or answer your question. There are a lot of robots that are programmed to go through the internet and fill out these forms advertising bogus services. Oh, okay. okay. So if you're a website yeah, owner, you start to get dozens of emails a day that are all fake. And you think, oh, if I can just put a CAPTCHA up there that makes sure it's a human that's filling out this form. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm a big fan of the, the basic math CAPTCHA, <clears throat> where you don't have to look at an image and get your glasses and do all this. It's just, what's two plus three? And really? you answer it, yeah. Okay. Um, so it involves human interaction. In a little order bit. To answer that. Yeah, but and it, it's going to weed out many most of, of it. Yeah. The robots. Yeah. Here's another situation that you see a lot, and it's probably more the retailers, uh, where you get the little window that pops up, and it's a customer service person. Hi, my name is Dwayne. Yep. Would you like to chat? Absolutely. Uh, What's sometimes that all about? I find those irritating, but I have to admit, sometimes I actually find them quite useful. For, for retailers and all businesses in general, the web is becoming a customer service portal. So some people will fill out a form and ask a question, but a lot of your customers will want to engage immediately to find an answer. Um, and chat's been a very effective way to do that as well as inbound leads. So somebody's on the site for a minute and you sell a product or service, you can say, hey, man, can I answer any questions? And it's a really effective way to, to increase the conversion rate of your website. You're doing a lot of either blogging or paying for advertising, um, whether it be print or digital, to drive all these people to your website to discover your product or service. And it's really smart to engage them. W one of the things that still is the best sales technique is speaking to somebody. It's, and you can do that through chat. Um, the other channel that's really powerful, particularly with large businesses, is Twitter. So, okay. I do this all the time where I interact with a customer service agent and I don't get the answer I want. I will tweet at the company because it's public facing. Large companies might have two, three million followers. And if I say I just had the worst experience of my life with this large publicly traded company, you will get an immediate response. <laughs> you will. And they will take care of you because they want that follow-up tweet like they, they took care of me. Oh. 
And that, I, that's I took Twitter off my phone because of uh, the amount of, uh, I just, it was just too many. Distracting. Too distracting. Yeah. I mean, I, you're in a world where, you know, this is, this is your world, my world. It's it, different. It's, yeah, I think everyone is a little bit different, like you were saying, whether you update things monthly, weekly, quarterly. Yep. But pick a mode with regards to frequency and try to try to maintain that based on your customer base. Right. And and whether they're engaging with you in those channels. Yeah. You know, so should I should I have a should should a, a Twitter account be something that would be part of of an investment advisory business? Probably not. Okay. Um, generally okay. investment okay. advisors want to speak very carefully. Um, yeah, like, about what like they're saying. Yeah, like like the president might yeah. want to do. Um, <laughs> like you might want to do. <laughs> Um, so, so Twitter's you know really an interaction channel. Um, okay. So probably not something I would focus on as an advisor. Um, if you're an investment advisor or anybody who's selling kind of yourself, I think LinkedIn having a very powerful LinkedIn professional profile, right. enormously important. Um, and that's probably where I would spend my my digital energy. Mm -hmm. um, you know that people if they're going to meet with you on a personal basis that's a spot where they might be, okay, well, he does this now, but yeah. I'm trusting his opinion, not just that he works for XYZ company and they're pretty big and I've heard of them or that he knows my brother-in-law. Uh, I want to see what's his background. You yeah. know, is, is he a CFP? Did is, he graduate from Drexel? Did he? Gra is he a Drexel right. alum? Right. Yeah, that um, important. And that's important. And who does he know? I mean, the other thing I do when I'm um, vetting potential people to do business with is who do they know? Even right. clients sometimes. So, you know, we are a pretty in-demand agency, so a lot of times we'll say, this client wants to work with us, let's see who they know on LinkedIn that we know and, and get an idea of how... Make a connection. Yeah, right. yeah, how good right. are they gonna be as a client? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Jason, uh, a lot of good information uh, as we were talking early on. Uh, there's always something to learn here, and uh, uh, you know, hopefully our listeners, uh, many of them have picked up on something and maybe a little more curious next time they do a search. So thank you, uh, very insightful. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, our guest uh, next time will be Skip Shuda of Shuda Consulting. Uh, he specializes in startup companies and apparently very knowledgeable about the uh, Pennsylvania cannabis law that is up for discussion. So if that's of interest, be sure to tune in next time to Money Matters. Thank you.